Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's great to see all of you. Um, thank you for being here to worship with us this morning. If you are worshiping on Facebook, we're also glad to have you there. Um, my name is Savannah, in case you don't know me, and I'm the Director of Discipleship here at Central. Um, once again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have another opportunity for you guys to benefit from our open table ministry today. Um, we mostly survive on donations at Open Table. Um, and so we've got some things that won't keep until next week. And so if you are interested, I think there is some produce and um, some like salad things like cabbage, lettuce, spinach, that sort of thing. There's some cakes. Um, and we will have to throw it away if you don't take it. So if you want any of that, you can go down to the PAC Center after uh, worship this morning. And there will be someone down there to help you kind of sort through and see what you want to get. So please take advantage of that if you'd like to. Um, otherwise, we are going to hear from our Crossfire Youth Choir today. So that's going to be awesome. I hope you are excited for that. Um, and now we're just here together to worship God. So let's spend a moment preparing ourselves for that worship. Welcome, church. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here online, we welcome you today. And it's, uh, it's been really good to hear the organ again this morning. Uh, Libby, as you know, wasn't with us for a few weeks. She accidentally hurt her right foot several weeks ago. And for those of you that sit on this side particularly know that both of her feet are quite busy over here at the console. And so we are glad to have you back this morning, Libby, and thank you for your blessing uh, of music to get us started today. So let's uh, continue with music as we sing together. Blessed be your name. Would you please stand and join us? One, two, three. And...
Let us pray. Jesus, today we come together to lift up our special church community to you. Bring healing and peace to all those struggling with their physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual health. Stamina and rest to those that are in caregiving roles. And the gift of your friendship to our shut-ins and others that may be experiencing loneliness. Use us to meet these needs. We are full of gratitude for both the big and small ways that our church is moving and growing. We see your hands in what is happening, both inside the walls of Central and outside in the community. Help us to pay attention and celebrate what you're doing along the way. Christ as a light, guide us. Christ as a shield, overshadow us. This day, be in us lowly and humble, yet full of power. Be in the heart of each person to whom we speak, in the mouth of each who speaks to us. Make our actions your actions and our words your words, reflecting the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. us to do difficult things, but he will always help us through them. Today we're learning about a man named Stephen who said that he believed in God and trusted God even when it was difficult. Stephen was a man full of God's grace and power. When men he encountered wanted to debate him, he had the answers, which the men did not like. 
the men convinced people to lie about Stephen. As the men started lying, Stephen's face became bright because he could see Jesus and God were there with him. God and Jesus are beside us even on the bad days. When we can't see them, we can always talk to them. Remember, they are always with us. Let us pray. Dear God, let us be like Stephen. Help us stand up for what we believe in and help us remember you are always with us. Amen. There we go. Okay. Um, so this month, you may know this already, but we have a special emphasis on stewardship in the church. And so we thought that it would be important that we communicate to you for the rest of the month just how much of an impact your giving makes in the life of this church. And so we have a special ministry moment planned for each week. Um, and at this time, I'm going to invite Rod Mooney to come up, and he is going to share um, something about stewardship and what that means to him personally. Thank you. I get to take this off. Um, my name's Rod Mooney, and Allison and I, my wife, uh, have been members here at Central for close to 15 years. And I would like to tell you just a little bit, just for a moment, about what tithing means to me and my family. I was trying to put this in words, but I found a paragraph that really summed it up, and uh, I would like to read this to you. The tithe was an obligation offering from the law of Moses requiring 10% of the Israelites' first fruits. Because God provided the harvest, this first part was returned to him. It was a reminder to Israel that all things that we have are his. It was a show of thankfulness for his provision. It also provided for the Levites, who were the priests of the church, festivals, and the needy. When I was growing up, my father worked at the building right across the street over here, Gregg and Gregg, and... I think at that time it was Union Trust Company. And uh, he had a Bible on his desk. And uh, he said that people would come in and ask him about why was the Bible there, and that's the way that he used to witness to people that maybe did not know God. Dad got me a job over there, and every afternoon I would come in late after school and empty the trash, sweep the floors, and clean the bathrooms. And then came the fun part. I got my first paycheck. I was so excited. My dad had it. He said, here you go, son. He said, now come on with me. I said, okay, where are we going? He said, we're going to go cash your check. Well, I knew how to cash a check. You just endorse the back of it and give it to the teller, and she gives you money. So we went to a teller, cashed a check, went back to his office. He opened a desk drawer, pulled out a church offering envelope. And he said, the first fruits go to God. And the first fruits is not what you got. It's before taxes. I learned a big lesson that day, and I have always remembered that. I would like to tell you that if you don't tithe and you think you can't afford it, I, I can understand that. I didn't think I could, I could afford it either. But maybe you want to start with 2% instead of 10. Maybe 3. Maybe give 3% for a year. The next year, maybe bump it up a percent. But the tithing is God's way that we can give back to him. Thank you.
Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Central United Methodist Church. My name is David Lee, and I am the pastor here. Um, if you're visiting or you're new, we want to just welcome you. Um, for you to know that your presence here is a blessing to us. So thank you. We pray that we hope that this time of worship can be a blessing to you. Um, first of all, I want to give it up for our youth. They, they really do live up to their name. They are youths on fire. So thank you uh, for, for working on that piece of music and then sharing that with us. I hope to see and hear more from you guys. Um, I also want to give thanks to Rod for it's not always, it's not easy to step in front of your church uh, and share something that personal. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for your courage to do that. Um, we don't often, uh, during this season, uh, I think we are probably starving for a little connection. And I feel like um, maybe we could try something like that, maybe in a safe way. And so let's take this moment to greet one another in the name of Christ. Uh, just take a, take a moment to greet one another at this time. Wasn't that nice? Yeah? Wasn't that nice? Well, maybe this week you could think about a person on your mind and reach out to that person during the week. That way we can continue to stay connected throughout. If you've been with us, you know that we have been journeying in the book of Acts uh, with the early church where we, were, where, be, where we are learning about all the things that they did, what they taught, and how they lived their lives as people of God. Well, today, um, we're going to be looking at the first Christian martyr. The first Christian martyr. A person that dies for what they believe. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 6 and a little bit in chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, please follow along. Acts chapter 6, beginning on verse 8. 8 to 15, and then we're going to jump to chapter 7, 54 to 60. Hear now God's word. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and others of those from Cilicia and Asia stood up and argued with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he spoke. Then they secretly instigated some men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people as well as the elders and the scribes. Then they suddenly confronted him seized them and brought them before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, this man never stops saying things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses handed on to us. And all who sat in the council looked intently at him and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears 
and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, re receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the last we heard, there was a, there was a food pantry opening up at the church. Seven were selected to run this operation. And that's really the first time we get to hear the name Stephen. In the sixth chapter of Acts, we got to hear about his shooting star ministry. The first deacon of the church, the first martyr, who really went down in history for being the first ordinary Christian to follow his shepherd to martyrdom. He was not one of the 12. He was not even a candidate to replace Judas when that slot came open. As far as we can tell, he was not anyone's idea of headline material. He was simply a good, faithful man who could be trusted to distribute food to those who were hungry without putting more on one person's plate than another's. Sometimes I think that if Stephen had been a better deacon, uh, that maybe he wouldn't have ended up a martyr. Because in those days, deacons were meant to be seen but not heard. They were supposed to wait on tables so that the apostles could devote themselves to the ministry of the word. But making sack lunches for the widows of Jerusalem turned out to be the least of Stephen's gifts. Once he had hands laid on his head, all the grace and power that poured into him seemed to just spill over as signs and wonders all around him. Luke doesn't really give us details here. Maybe Stephen really did try to keep a low profile. Maybe he was just, maybe he was just handing someone her lunch one day when he healed them by mistake. Maybe he only meant to stir the soup and not the spirit. But the spirit lit up on him. So that some from the synagogue could not take their eyes off of him. They watched him and they listened to him. And based on what they saw and what they heard, they decided this was no friend of God. Because in their mind, he showed no respect for what God had taught them through Moses. So they brought charges against him, standing him up before the council, going down their list of grievances, disrespect of holy places, disrespect of holy customs, passed down from generation to generation. When they had finished, Luke tells us, there was a moment of exquisite silence in which all of the council members sat looking at Stephen and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. We didn't get to hear the sermon that got Stephen killed, but I do want you to get a, a sense of what he said, at least a bit of it at the end, his furious conclusion. He said, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. He was calling them the enemies of God. 
and it did not take them long to figure out how to absolve themselves of this guilt. So they dragged Stephen out of the city and threw rocks at him until he died. You know, when you put Stephen and Jesus together, it's pretty hard to deny that this is what Christian success looks like. Not converting other people to our way of thinking. Not having the oldest, prettiest church in town. Not even going out of our way to be kind and generous. But here, this. Telling the truth so clearly that some people want to kill us for it. But let's not confuse that uh, with people that maybe most of us have known who believe that they are being martyrs when they are really being just obnoxious. <laughs> the, uh, you know, the ones that harass you about your faith until you finally have to say, please leave me alone. Um, and then they start to moan about how, how hard it is to serve the Lord. Only... I do not think that's how martyrdom works. I don't think you can seek it out any more than you can try and avoid it. I think it just happens sometimes when people, when people get so wrapped up in living their life for God, in living God's life for them, that they forget to protect themselves. They forget to look out for, for the danger and the warning signs. And the next thing they know, it's raining rocks. This was Barbara Brown Taylor's insight. An Episcopal priest, an academic, an author. Uh, she helped me to understand this truth in a much deeper way. Through some examples of people who have lived and died in just this past century. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was born in 1906 in Germany where he grew up to be a pastor in what was called the Confessing Church, one of the few Christian communities that began to make noise when Hitler rose to power in 1933. During his early ministry, uh, Bonhoeffer served churches, he wrote books, he organized a new seminary for his denomination. And in 1939, he was introduced to a group seeking to overthrow Hitler. On April 1943, Bonhoeffer was arrested by the Nazis and put in prison. When, in, when an attempt on Hitler's life failed one year later, there were documents that were discovered uh, that linked Bonhoeffer to that plot. And so he was sent to a concentration camp. And on Sunday, April 8, 1945, he was conducting a church service in prison when two men came to him and said, Prisoner Bonhoeffer, come with us. And he was hanged the next day at Flossenburg Prison. Archbishop Oscar Romero soon to be a saint, I hear, in the Catholic Church. I know as Protestants, right, we kind of cringe, right, at that word saints. Uh, but for me, I guess the way I look at it, it's just, it's just language. Because I know that I have known saints in the church. And I have no problems calling those people saints. Um, we just don't have a process for making it official. Oscar Romero was appointed Archbishop of El Salvador in in the 1970s. He started out as an obedient chaplain to the military officers and the wealthy landowners who controlled the country. Well, that lasted until the night that he looked out his window to see a huge crowd gathering in the streets. They were mostly poor, uh, but they had decided to stop dying quietly and start asking loudly for what they and their children needed to live, justice, education, 
a decent wage. As Archbishop Romero walked among them, government soldiers opened fire, and a great many people were killed that day. And Romero was converted that night, and he became a powerful advocate for the least among his flock. The officers and landowners called him a traitor. And while he was celebrating a funeral mass for a woman in his congregation, he was shot dead at the altar. Jonathan Myrick Daniels was a 26-year-old seminary student at the Episcopal Theological Seminary in Cambridge, Massachusetts. When he heard Martin Luther King on television one night asking volunteers to come to Selma, Alabama, to help secure the right of all people to vote. It was March of 1965. Daniels asked his dean for a leave of absence from his studies, and then he went on to Hainville, Alabama, where he landed in jail in August for joining a picket line. When, when he and four others were unexpectedly released one afternoon, they felt, they sensed that something was wrong. They walked together to a small store near the jail, took refuge inside. And moments later, a 16-year-old black girl named Ruby Sales reached the top step into the store when a man with a gun suddenly appeared and started cursing her. Daniels pulled the girl aside and was shot in her stead. I got to meet Ruby Sales. She's still alive. Uh, a few years back in 2018, and spent an afternoon with her in a room full of pastors in the Greensboro area. She is still fighting the good fight. She is still razor sharp, articulate, and powerful. And it's surprising because she looks so sweet, almost like a grandmother, right? See, there she is. <laughs> Ruby said something that really stuck out. It wasn't from the gathering that I was at, but it was, it was, at, another, it was at another gathering, and a pastor told me about it. I tried looking for the quote exactly, but I couldn't find it. So what I, think I, what I thought I'd do is I'd give you an idea of what she said. She said, a lot of people talk about the pain and the wounds of the black person, and rightly so. But nobody talks about the pains and wounds of the white person. What does it do to a person in his psyche, in his soul, to know that they had fathers, grandfathers, and family members who were part of the KKK, who were part of evil, racist, criminal acts against, a, against another human being just because of the color of their skin? To know that this is the legacy of their family that this is their family heritage. So you see, there is hurt there too. There needs to be healing there as well. If we are to move forward as a society, to come together in some meaningful way, to be reconciled to God and to one another, to, to in fact create a heaven on earth, there needs to be healing on both sides. Not everyone is called to be a martyr. Some of us try really hard not to be. But I think it's important to remember that for some of those who believed, it meant putting something else ahead of their own safety. As best as I can tell, none of these people had dying as a goal. 
It was just what happened to them while they were living the fullest lives they could, trying to make that same life available to someone else. And what their murderers found out over and over again was that trying to get rid of them by killing them worked about as well as trying to get rid of dandelions by blowing on their puffs. The harder the wind blew, the further the seeds spread. And some of them blew all the way here, where it is safe to say that we are sustained by the blood of the martyrs. As antique as that phrase sounds, blood has been spilled for us and for many. And for us who believe and call on the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior, this life on earth is not the end of the story. We are meant to give our lives away in love and service so that God may continue to fill us with his life. This life is only a prelude to the life we will have with God for eternity. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us move on to our time of offering. Um, it is a time in the service where we are able to respond in faith and in gratitude for all the ways that God has continued to bless and provide for us despite challenging times that we have been living through. Um, we will not be passing the plates, but boxes, offering boxes are available at the exits. Please give as you feel led. As we, as Libby uh, will be playing us a song, let us reflect on the ways that God has continued to bless us and provide for us that we may, in fact, give back and serve in his name.
God of new life, out of the abundance of our lives, we offer these gifts to you. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. experience the fullness of God's love and grace in your life. This week, I want you to seek out God's grace and love in your lives so that it can free you up. He can free you up so that all of that love and joy and blessings that you've experienced can spill out into everyone you meet, spill out into every place you go so that God's love and God's blessings may be shared through your life. This is the benediction for you so that you may go forth and be a blessing to others. Go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.